It is 11 o'clock and we are going to begin our all-day work session uh, Monday, April 16th. Uh, we do have seven board members here, so we are able to uh, begin. Uh, the first uh, session is topic is going to be on the state standards of accreditation. Um, you will note on your agenda that it says from 11 to 1, but there is the possibility because this is information only that we may be able to do this within 90 minutes and that would enable us to uh, break earlier for lunch and therefore start a half an hour earlier um, at one o'clock for the strategic plan goal one report where I do know there is a great deal of board interest and we will probably have an extensive conversation on the third item as well. Um, so before I turn this over to Dr. Duran, I see a signal from my colleague, Mr. Yeah, Moon. I only had 35 questions to ask, but I cut it down to 15. That is much appreciated, Mr. Moon. Thank you so much. Uh, so, so again, to my colleagues, um, uh, Dr. Duran is going to walk us through this first section. Uh, while it is informational only, he will go into the detail of why this is so important for the board to be briefed on this and what things we need to be thinking about as a board. All right, good morning, and thank you again for taking the time for this important update. And as Ms. McLaughlin said, this is really an update and information on the changes to the standards of accreditation at the state level. But before we begin, I definitely want to make sure I acknowledge the individuals, some in the room, most are in the room, who helped contribute to putting this report together. With me today, who will be helping present the bulk of today's report is Betris Huffman, the Director of the Office of Student Testing. And so you'll be hearing from her for a bulk of today's presentation. She's definitely taken the lead in helping us to unpack and understand this work. But we also have, and you'll see why we have in a moment, some other partners from other offices who've helped us to um, craft this presentation, but certainly unpack the knowledge that we're gaining from the state. And so in the audience we have with us Marianne Panarelli and Cindy Dickinson from the Office of Intervention and Prevention Services. Uh, we also have Jen Glazer and Daryl Sampson from the Office of Counseling and College and Career Readiness. So I want to thank them for helping us put this together and for their ongoing support as we actually begin to implement and support our schools with these new changes. Unlike many other uh, board work sessions uh, that we've come to you on, this one is really about not asking you to uh, make recommendations, but to understand what has been approved at the state level and has already been written into code uh, by the State Board of Education. So overall, you will see these revisions in the state accountability system, I think is fairly positive. There are some changes that we will highlight that this board has been advocating for, that we have been advocating for, and so we're overall very pleased with these changes. There are a few places you will see where we did not see some changes that we would like to have, and where we would continue to need all of our advocacy and support in making those recommendations moving forward. But I think that one thing that uh, you'll see as a plus is that th these changes help align us more to our work around portrait of a graduate and what the state is calling what they stole from us, I think, but the profile of a graduate at the uh, state level. As you can see from our outcomes today, we're going to focus the bulk of our presentation on really understanding what those changes are. So these changes, as you can see, include specific areas of school accreditation calculations, and that's a major one for us as we think about our schools. Also, you're going to see some changes as it relates to graduation requirements for our incoming ninth graders that will be entering this fall. And also, and here's where the board has had a lot of advocacy, and we certainly appreciate all the, the uh, messaging that you have done and the work that you've done to see reductions in some of the testing load for our students. And we'll talk to you about that. So throughout the session, again, we're going to highlight those areas where we're pleased with and those where we also could really use some more advocacy. Um, finally, we're going to draw attention to the ways in which FCPS is very well positioned to implement these changes and our next steps as we move forward and work with our schools. First, though, I think it's very important to be aware that state level, as we call SOA, or Standards of Accreditation, is only one of several ways in which Virginia's schools are monitored. Oftentimes, we hear people interchangeably use SOA and ESSA, and they're not interchangeable. They are two distinct different accountability systems. The federal rules are governed by Every Student Succeeds Act, or ESSA, and they are a second way of monitoring our schools. 
But today, we're not going to be talking about ESSA, as our ESSA plan is actually still pending final approval at the U.S. Department of Education. Therefore, any ESSA changes, we will do not yet know. We have recommendations, and again, we will not be discussing any of those uh, drafts that were put in place proposal. We're going to focus our time on the SOA. But it's important to differentiate that because oftentimes, again, we see and use uh, interchangeably. The nugget here, as you look at this uh, graph on the slide, is that Virginia schools and divisions are really accountable under a variety of measures. And each has an important purpose. Today, though, we're going to highlight and hone in on the SOA piece. 2017-2018 is definitely a transition year for us, and it's a lot about learning about what these SOA changes are. In late January, BDOE released example calculations showing how these new rules that we're going to be sharing with you today would impact our schools if they had been effect for the 16-17 year. These example reports were sent to us as a way to help us better understand exactly what it might look like for our schools, again using 1617 data. These reports, uh, Betris is going to show you in a minute how you can actually access them and look at the individual schools in your regions to see what it would look like. She will be referencing that shortly. When calculating a new accreditation status based on the 1718 data, VDOE is going to be doing a crossover approach. First, they're going to run the data using the old SOA rules, and then schools that show fully accredited based on the old rules will be assigned accredited status. This is the transition year. Then for any school who shows anything other than fully accredited with the old rules, they will turn around and run the new rules and see whichever uh, it benefits the school. And that's just for the first year, which would be the next year. So again, in this transition year, you may have schools operating basically under either of those rules. Beginning next school year, all changes, though, will be fully enacted. This applies to the data that is generated during 2018 to determine schools' accreditation status for the following year. And as I've already indicated, graduation requirements will be in place for entering ninth graders in the fall. So now to better understand a little bit more of those details, Betris Huffman is going to walk us through some of the specifics as it relates to those changes. Thank you. So as Dr. Dron said, my role here today is to um, share with you a little bit about the specifics of the way in which this new accreditation program will be calculated for our schools so that we can understand then what are the implications for our school's performance and the ways in which we want to support them. Um, in this brief overview, it's separated into four chunks or four parts. The first here is the overall school status. So when comparing the old system that we currently operate under with the new system that is now going to be in effect, we see that essentially bottom line is we have some simplified terminology for our schools. Looking at how each of these designations is assigned for our schools will be um, measured on individual indicators. And we'll look at those now. So again, under our current system, we have only five indicators for which schools are measured. Like with the old system, each school's designation is based on how they perform on those indicators. But whereas we had only five under the new system, with the new system we have up to nine. Six for elementary and middle schools and nine for high schools. You'll notice that on this um, right side of the chart, for the new indicators, that are under operation in our new system, most of them are either brand new to us or are a change from how they existed under the old system. Again, thinking back to our current system, each indicator is measured based on the level of performance a school makes with that. In the current system, that measurement is strictly whether the school met or did not meet the target. However, under the new system, there's a much more nuanced approach. Rather than a strict target number that schools are asked to meet, 
there's a matrix that has been identified for each of the nine indicators that's very specific to the outcomes intended for that measure. There's a direct link within the presentation that will take you to that matrix so that you can see how a level one, two, or three would be assigned for each of the nine indicators for a school. However, that's also posted on the command center um, as a resource for all of our schools to access. In general, you can see from this chart that though those, the matrix is detailed and specific based on the outcomes intended for each measure, generally speaking, a level one will mean that school met the target or they improved their performance over the prior year. Generally speaking, a number two, level two, means that they were near the target or, again, they improved their performance from the prior year. And you'll see that a level three, or red, means that either the school was quite distant from the target or they were stagnant at the level two status, meaning they might have been close to that status of that target for four consecutive years but were unable to meet the target after, over time based on their improvement work. When that occurs, a school will be downgraded from the level two performance to a level three to indicate that that is an area where they need to give additional focus. The level one, two, and three that is assigned to each specific indicator is then used to form an overall picture of the school. So from the overall picture, we identify the overall status showing that if the school was entirely composed of level ones and twos, any mixtures of greens and yellows, the school will be assigned an accredited status for the year. However, should even a single level three red be introduced into that overall picture for the school, the school's status for the year will be assigned as accredited with conditions. We will expect in Fairfax that we will have many, many schools that are accredited, and we will expect to have some schools accredited with conditions, particularly in these first few years. What is very different about this process than what we have in our current system is that third indicator, accreditation denied. You'll notice from the definition there that this does not mean that a school has many level threes. It has nothing to do with the number of level threes that a school has. What accreditation denied indicates is that the school has failed to demonstrate action toward their performance measures. So they recognize their performance and improvements that are needed. However, they are failing to take those actions. And as a result, the state has determined that they will be accredited denied. This slide shows four examples of how that overall picture might play out. And it's intended to give you kind of some extreme scenarios. So you'll notice the first two on the left-hand side are both accredited, one with a mix of greens and yellows. And you'll notice, even in a case where every single indicator were yellow, the school would still be accredited, completely accredited. However, in that next example where we have even a single indicator of red or level three introduced, the school is now accredited with conditions. And then the last example shows that hypothetically, we could have a school that had all level threes. This would be unusual and, and not expected, but hypothetically, so long as a school was demonstrating measurable actions toward their improvement plan and the state was satisfied with those actions, they would not necessarily be determined, accredited, denied. So again, the picture, the message here is that it is not the colors that make the status it's the movement toward that action that makes the overall status. I do wanna point out here as well that there's a, a link on this slide that will take you to a command center page, and I believe Cheryl is going to take us there now just to demonstrate how you can access those reports that Dr. Duran was referencing. 
On this page, you'll see that it gives you a little bit of an overview about those example reports that the state ran. Again, that was based on 2016-17 data, so old data, has no bearing on accreditation, as the page says. However, when you click on any of the regions, it will extend and give you by pyramid all of the schools in that region. And then if you click on any school's name, it will pull up for you that school's individual example report. It's usually five or six pages per school, very detailed. So we won't be talking through one now, but I wanted to be sure you knew for the schools that are in your um, magisterial districts that you have interest in looking at more closely, this is a place where you can get a picture of how they might have performed had the new rules been in effect for this current year. Thank you. You can go back to the presentation. So now that we've looked at the status that a school can be assigned, and generally speaking, how that status is assigned to a school, I want to share with you what about, what's that mean? What's that mean for us as far as how schools are being held accountable? So under the new system, we have, again, schools are being monitored based on the level of performance that they're assigned. In the new monitor, in the new system, we're monitoring for support based on the um, specific indicators. Specifically, for any school that has for the three achievement indicators, English achievement, math achievement, or science achievement, if the school measures a, a level two yellow, then that school will be asked to undergo academic review. A big win for us that demonstrates the, um, the recognition that the state has offered to our Office of School Support under the direction of Mark Greenfelder and his team, the state has indicated that based on our track record, they will be permitting this academic review for any schools in this scenario to be undertaken by our Fairfax County Office of School Support. Of course, those, report, those results will be reported to the state, and there's Mr. Greenfelder now. <laughs> And, but that is a huge win for us. And again, that really demonstrates kudos for the work that that team has done and the recognition that they've earned from the state. For any school that has a level three red for any indicator, whether it is those academic indicators or any of the non-academic indicators or the achievement gap indicators, those schools will be asked to undergo a corrective action plan. But again, we've been We've been told by the state that we will be able to monitor that and develop that through the work of our Fairfax County Office of School Support. So again, a big win for us. So all in all, we're very well positioned based on the work of our Office of School Support and the work of our departments to be able to support schools under these new systems. So next, I wanted to share with you a little more detail about the academic indicators. There are a total of five academic indicators under our new program. And three of these are very similar to what we've had in the past, though we do have some changes, and two are new for us. The English and math achievement show an area where we have had effective advocacy in Fairfax County Public Schools. First of all, the idea behind this new combined rate that's being used to measure achievement is showing that the state is now willing to recognize not only schools who are helping their students pass their standards of learning assessments, but it's also recognizing schools who are helping students make progress toward those goals. So we are still measuring students who are passing their tests. But in addition to that, we are now able to measure students who show progress on a progress table that's been established by the state on their standards of learning assessments or their VAP assessments, and students also who are English learners who show progress on their English, uh, their WIDA Access for L's assessment. So this is very exciting and an update just from the end of last week that the state has also recognized that they will now permit us to give this calculation, this credit for students making progress before they apply adjustments. Adjustments are a 
portion of the accreditation calculation were students who have transferred to Fairfax or who are, are newer into our country as English learners do not count against our schools if they don't pass the test. That is still the case. They still will not count against our schools if they do not pass the test. However, now under the new changes just from the end of last week, they will be able to count for our schools even if they don't pass a test, so long as they do show growth in one of these ways. So that's a huge win that we're really, really excited about in the advocacy. If, if I could just double down on that, that's work we did back in the summer. Your team, Francisco, we had a conference call with the state superintendent and we pushed, pushed, pushed. It was time to get credit for where these kids are and our ability to have them start to grow, even if they're still short of the passing benchmark. So well, well done, well done. So just to, um, to reinforce, this is now a four-step process. Step one, see which students passed the assessment, including those students who qualified for remediation recovery. Step two, count also those students up through grade eight who demonstrated growth on their standards of learning test based on the progress table that's linked on this slide. Step three, look at the English learners for the English gap achievement who demonstrated progress on their WIDA access for L's. And then step four, for the students who did not meet any of those, if they qualify for adjustments, adjust them out. Okay. That same four-step methodology will be applied as well for our achievement gap measurements. So this first portion that you'll see as I show on the slide is just to reinforce that the way in which the state is approaching the concept of achievement gaps for the standards of accreditation is not the way in which we have often spoken about achievement gaps in Fairfax County. We often think about the performance of our groups compared to each other. So you can see in the image, many of the graphs we look at in our data we're looking at the performance of all of our groups side together and seeing where we may have differences between that performance. The way in which the state is measuring achievement gaps is instead, though, measuring the performance of each of our reporting groups against the target, the benchmark of 75 for English or the benchmark of 70 for mathematics. And this text reinforces that. We have seven total reporting groups for the state of Virginia, four ethnic groups, economically disadvantaged students with disabilities, and English learners. So for each of those seven groups, a school's performance, that same combined rate methodology, those four steps, would be applied to see for each group, did they meet the 75 target or did they not meet that target for English and same for math. <coughs> Then, once the progress is measured, the combined rate is measured for each of those groups and assigned a level one, a level two, or a level three, there is yet another matrix applied. Again, this is part of that progress performance level that I um, had linked to in a previous slide. So that overall performance for the English achievement gap for the school and the mathematics achievement gap for the school is determined based on the picture of level ones, twos, and threes from each of the seven reporting groups. So the performance groups all together combine to give you a single outcome for English achievement gap and a single outcome for mathematics achievement gap for the school. Moving on to science, this is the one area that is basically unchanged from our current system. We continue to have um, the student pass rates being measured. There is no combined rate for science. And we continue to have a 70% for our target. Of course, like with the other areas, we now have a level two yellow indicator that's in between. And like with the other levels, we can also have a reduction in our failure rate to get closer to that performance. History will no longer Ventress, be part- Can I share one thing there? Science remains one of our still biggest focus for legislative advocacy. We wanted to apply the same thing for English to science. A lot of our schools, a lot of your schools that have been penalized are because kids, particularly at elementary school, have low science scores. All we ask for is the same treatment for science as we did for English. 
We're not there yet. There's no change to science, but that's going to be one that we are going to continue to ask for. And Francisco, correct me, Sloan, correct me, if, or Betris, if I'm wrong. In, in that's the, correct, that. yes. And it is one that the board did advocate for, but we did not see change. So you're absolutely correct. So history will no longer be part of our accreditation calculation for schools. This is an important piece for us to keep in mind, in particular because while it's no longer part of our accreditation, it will be wrapped into one of our high school indicators that we see later on. And additionally, there will, as of now, still be history tests through, um, through this spring and into the future as well. We will look at some of those testing changes that will be coming when Dr. Duran comes back in in a moment. The next part of our calculations that we'll look at are related to chronic absenteeism. Chronic absenteeism is a completely new measure in the state of Virginia, and it's looking on how our academic attendance is impacting student performance in grades K to 12. Notice that was grades K to 12. Like with the academic indicators, there will be an opportunity to show growth by reducing that rate by 10% from one year to the next. So for chronic absenteeism, we're looking at a measure for the school as a whole. What is the percentage of the student population for whom that, that are determined to be chronically absent? And of that student population, is that 15% or fewer of the students are chronically absent or more? To determine whether each student is chronically absent, we then look at that student's enrollment and their attendance. Chronic absenteeism, unlike some of our other attendance and truancy measures, is speaking only about full day absences. It is measuring also absences for any reason, be they prearranged, excused, or unexcused. So a student who is absent for a full day, regardless of the reason, would be considered absent, and that absence would count toward their chronic absenteeism count. If the student throughout the academic year misses 10% of more of the time that they were enrolled at that school, then they will be deemed chronically absent. And another note that's not listed on the slide is that only students who are enrolled at the school for more than half of the year will be counted for the school. So a typical school year with 180 days, we would be looking only at students who are enrolled at that school for 91 days or more. And let's pretend a student is enrolled at that school for 100 days. They were there more than half of the year. And since they were enrolled for 100 days, 10% of their year is 10 days. If the student missed 10 days or more in that scenario, that student would be chronically absent. Whereas a student who was enrolled the full 180 days would need to, meet, would need to miss 18 days or more to be deemed chronically absent. So that's one aspect of how this calculation will work. An area of advocacy from the board and from our departments was to support the move away from a strict look at truancy as the state was beginning to consider how to look at absenteeism within their accreditation rating. We supported a move to, um, to a chronic absenteeism look because it is a more comprehensive view of attendance and better represents the research that students who miss 10% or more of their academic time have a high correlation to lower academic performance. You will see that at the early grades, one of the ways in which that chronic absenteeism may manifest itself as a, as a hindrance for students' progress is in their literacy development. In the middle grades, we see particularly an impact on test performance. And at the high school level, we see a high correlation to dropouts and other academic failures. So by having attention from the kindergarten level and all the way through our pyramid progress, we know that we will have a stronger focus on keeping our students in school and engaged so that they can meet their academic outcomes. 
There are two links on this slide that will take you to some talking points that you can use to assist in your conversations with your communities and parents related to how absenteeism or attendance rather, how attendance for students is critical for their performance, as well as a sample newsletter that you or principals could reference in communication with your communities. And then the final part that I will look at is related to the high school indicators. We have three indicators that are strictly measured at the high school level. So elementary and middle schools will not be measured at all against these with, with regard without um, discounting the impact of their pyramid progress on these indicators. First of all, GCI, or Graduation and Completion Index, is calculated by assigning a different weight to each of the student outcomes in a graduating class. Students who gain a diploma, any of the board recognized diplomas, earn 100 points. Students who earn a GED earn 75 points. Students who may not graduate but continue, they return to continue in school, earn 70 points and 25 points for um, students who earn a certificate of completion. Dropouts or students who are not accounted for at the end of their term are considered a zero points. That formula also will take into account students with disabilities and English learners who are allowed additional time in the state of Virginia to gain their diploma. So while that weighted formula that I just went through at Dr. Moon's request from uh, an email was um, that formula is not changed under this new system. So the 100 points, 75 points, those are all exactly the same. What has changed is this target. You'll notice that for a level one green, we now need 88 for the index rather than the current 85. So that is a change as far as the level of focus that schools will need. Additionally, we now have a new rate um, of dropout. Dropout is another lens or another angle on the same issue of graduation. However, what we've seen, because of the way in which it's measured on a four-year cohort, we have seen that some of our schools who are able to attain the level one green on those example calculations for their GCI are not able to maintain the level one green in dropout because it is measured in a different way and a different lens. This may be an area for continued advocacy from our board and from our departments with the state as we think about the potential impact on our schools of measuring them under both of these ways. And then finally, the last area is College Career and Civic Readiness Index. The College Career Civic Readiness Index is again a new measure and it closely aligns to our portrait of a graduate and our college career readiness outcomes. It broadens our look at high school beyond simply the academic and, and walking out the door of high school diploma look to also those post-secondary outcomes and readiness for that. We will be looking at, in this new measure, how students who enter ninth grade this coming fall and therefore are part of the graduating cohort of the class of 2020, or 22, excuse me, 2022, those students will be the first group who are measured under this indicator. So until then, our high schools will have a not applicable listed for them. Additionally, some of the details as to how this will be calculated precisely, the details of that matrix, are still being established by the state, what they will consider in each of these categories. But what we do know so far is that they will be looking at how students are participating in advanced coursework, career and technical education opportunities, work-based learning opportunities, and service learning experiences. Our departments have been working very closely with our information technology to make sure we have systems in place to help us tracking that um, student outcomes in those manners so that when this does roll into effect, we will be able to report out for these opportunities for our students fully. And that takes us through the rest of our academic and, and non-academic indicators. So now we just want to finish up with talking a little bit more about the details and the changes as it relates to graduation, because again, that, these changes will now impact students entering the ninth grade this fall. So first of all, you could see there are some things that are not changed, and, and um, you'll notice that the 
number of standard credits and the number of, and the categories for those remain essentially the same for standard and, and advanced studies diplomas. So you still need the 22 and the 26. That has not changed. The biggest area of change, though, that we, I want you to pay attention to, and one that you should be uh, one that you advocated for strongly was the reduction in the number of verified credits needed. And this is where, again, the legislative advocacy in, this, in previous work sessions we've had, it was brought up by many of you around the table about how can we better align our expectations to what's expected at the federal level. So currently, students need six verified credits to earn a standard and nine verified credits to earn an advanced studies. Starting with the incoming freshmen, they will both need five for both diplomas. So regardless of whether it's an advanced or standard diploma, it will be five. So a reduction in, in several of those verified credits. New requirements, though, that you see on the far right column of, this, uh, of the chart up here are that students will now need to take an AP, IB, honors, or CTE course and credential or, and sequential electives for the advanced studies diploma. So as we, we are already do see that a requirement for our standard diploma, and we do have students that are engaged currently in many of the AP, IB uh, honors or CTE credential courses. So while this is a change and it is new, we do see that this is something that we will be able to address, and we are working towards this in many ways already. The sequential electives simply means that if a student is taking, for example, um, a, a French one, they would need to take a French two or something like that, so sequentially be in place there. Um, these students with the goal of having more fully explore at least one elective area, so to more fully get into that. Um, a STEM engineering followed by a STEM advanced engineering is a better example probably as we think about that area. As you've seen from the presentation thus far, the revised SOAs provide an emphasis on school accountability as well as making sure that we have steps in place to have students college and career ready and align us to our portrait of a graduate or the state's profile of a graduate. And having those indications of growth and abilities to show and account for growth is really important. So we know that we shared a lot with you today and, and you probably didn't gather all the data and the information, but we want you to hopefully see some of the shifts and some of those changes. With regards to a graduation, we also see a new expectation for schools and divisions on ways that we support students in the development of career and academic planning. The student learning plan is already currently implemented in FCPS middle and high school's curriculum, and this is going to help us to continue to support students in that work. Academic and career plan portfolios that follow and document students' initial career interests and explorations will now be introduced at the elementary level and then transition on into our student learning plan work. So under the new SOA uh, expectations that you see on this slide, middle school students will either complete a career investigations course or access that course standards as part of their instructional program. SCPS advocated and we were able to receive the ability to incorporate some of those career investigation standards into some of our existing courses. So that was a big plus for us. The changes in graduation requirements, as well as an overarching emphasis on developing the profile of a graduate, have translated into shifts that we, in testing expectations as well, some that we see are very positive. Through my role serving on the SO Innovation Committee, I've had the opportunity to see a lot of this work unfold and be able to advocate on our behalf, as well as the advocacy that you all have done as a board has really helped shift this area. However, this is an area where we still need to continue some more advocacy. Dr. Braben mentioned the science area. There's also additional areas where we need to work on. But let's look a little deeper at what those expectations are by each level. <clears throat> Most of the changes we see in, this, in the new SOA are at the high school level and are a logical outflow from what we see in the graduation requirements that we just discussed in terms of those verified credits. With fewer verified credits needed for all incoming ninth graders, the SOL tests, which serve as those uh, you know, primary means of verify, verifying those credits, will be less necessary and less of a barrier to graduation. And that's something that this board has talked about many, many times. So starting with the new column on the far right in this chart, 
we see that the SOAs have introduced a restriction against testing high school students after they have fulfilled their verified credits. That's really an important piece to, to note because in a content area. So as long as they have already fulfilled their relevant testing requirements, that is now being restricted. And that is a means of advocacy actually that we saw from many school boards and many community members as the State Board of Ed went out and did their listening sessions where they saw that and heard that there was too much testing that was happening for students. So this overrides existing state policy which requires students to take the test anytime they enroll in an SOL course. As for example, a student who's currently enrolled in a chemistry class must take the SOL test even if he or she does not need their science verified credit. That's the current policy. Under the new rule, we expect to see students not testing even though they are enrolled in an SOL course if they have already verified that science credit. So again, this allows students to not have to take as many tests and better focus themselves on their graduation and what's needed moving forward. And as this board has talked, some of the stress that we've talked about, the mental health and wellness that we see related to many of our high school students as it resolves around testing. So again, this board has really, really helped us in that area in their advocacy. Along these lines, we also see new project-based assessment options for writing and history social science at the high school level, which is another area we have advocated for and one we believe both as a division and certainly what we heard from you as our colleagues on the board, something you wanted us to see happen. How can we better capture and assess those portrait of a graduate skills that happen at the science level, at the history level, and the writing level. We didn't get science, we got history, and we got writing. Moving to a look at the changed column, the SOAs now include a provision to extend the subject areas where a locally awarded verified credit, or what we say LAVC, you'll hear that terminology more, may be awarded. So this is written to apply to entering ninth graders again next fall, and we will see those details, as Betra said, they're still being worked out from VDOE. Finally, in the unchanged column, you see that students will still test at least once in each of the five verified credits, but now it is only once in those five, not required for every SOL-related course that they take. And also, schools and students will be able to access tests like advanced placement and IB, International Baccalaureate, connected to advancing coursework for their college and career credits. Unlike the high school and the mid uh, level, the um, elementary and middle did not have major changes. There are very few. Advocacy for further changes in this area is one we would like to see, particularly as it relates to project-based assessments. As SOL replacements is ongoing, we hope to see a little bit more relief for our elementary and middle schools. So you can see unchanged all of the things that we currently have in place here. To wrap up today's presentation and open up for comments that you may have on this information, uh, I'd like to share with you a few of the ways in which our existing FCPS structures and what we're putting in place for next year is gonna really well position us to respond to these SOA changes. Through the leadership on this board, our division has already put some significant groundwork in place. And the leadership of Dr. Braybrand, he asked us to bring to you a plan around equity, around our Office of School Support enhancements, and about how we will close the achievement gap. So we believe that those three areas are really helping us to be in a good place with these new SOA changes that we have outlined for you today. The Office of School Support and Equity Plan, which were presented in March to you, talked about the need to really think about more schools, to look more closely at some of those subgroups that perhaps we have not paid attention to in all of our schools, or to look at them and pay attention to them in a very different way, and to put resources in place, professional development in place, that will help each of our school leaders and teachers better support and understand their student needs. So that is a real positive. The closing achievement gap work that we are talking about is our, in our strategic plan and how we're prioritizing that in our strategic plan, again, is helping us position for these new SOA changes moving forward. We really also think that if we 
think about our school improvement planning process and align it to the work we're doing at our strategic plan level at the board, or Dr. Braben has asked us to, instead of try and do so many different things, pick those few priorities that we will really focus on. It might look different school by school based upon what you saw in terms of the yellow, red, and green. So some schools may have not had a yellow or a red in an area previously that they're now gonna to need to pay attention to. We then have the Office of School Support, some of our equity work, and our strategic plan resources that will help better target us around those red and those yellow areas. In addition to our um, division-wide strategies and plans that we have begun to put in place, all of our departments are engaged in very collaborative work to offer schools and students more support around the academic and also hopefully you, you gathered from this presentation the non-academic needs that are gonna be seen in the accountability measure. The focus on the chronic absenteeism being one that we really need to wrap our hands around our schools differently. The Department of Special Services, as I indicated, that um, Cindy Dickinson, Marianne Panarelli, who are here under um, Teresa Johnson's leadership, they have begun to really look at what does chronic absenteeism mean under the definition? Also, what are some of the schools that have been showing some over time some need to su need support around absenteeism? Some of the schools we hadn't really looked at previously in terms of needing our support. And then how do we communicate to our parents and to our community what does that mean and how does that impact our school's performance? So we have begun a lot of these conversations. The good thing is that we were engaged in this process throughout. We had the VDOE um, actually come to Fairfax, if you recall. Ms. Strauss spoke with them about many areas of advocacy. Much of what was asked of by Ms. Strauss as representing the board, you see in these changes today. We have been at the table at the SL Innovation Committee. Petrus and her team have been working very closely, giving recommendations to where we might see a potential change. She shared the one with you that just came last week. That was directly from an email that was sent from us saying, this may or may, or may not really make sense for our English language learners. They took a month or so to look at it, came back last week and said, you're right, and made an adjustment. So being that close to this process has helped us. Your leadership as a board has really helped us because we have heard from you countless times on the areas that are important to you as it relates to the verified credits, the number of testing, and the stress that you see as students. So we're pleased in that way of these SOA changes. Again, they aren't the whole picture because we're still waiting for ESSA, which will be a second um, accountability measure, but we're happy to see that this is in place for SOA, and it is things that have already been adopted and approved and moving forward for next year. So with that, we, I thank you, and I know it was a lot of information to cover. Uh, again, just in closing, I wanna reiterate that we encourage you to look at those school-level reports that are examples from 1617, and if you have questions about any of this, please reach out to us so we can better help you understand these new SOA changes and how they will impact our work, the terminology we use, the reports that we provide to you moving forward. Thank you. Francisco, I just want to thank you and your team for the amazing work you've done. I know the board's going to have questions. And if I could, Ms. McLaughlin, just finish with four nuggets out of this at a board level or for the public. You're going to see less red in the state accreditation process, but more yellow. You're going to see more schools when you look at your schools with the yellow. There's more indicators now, and there'll be more things where there'll be a yellow. Notice, too, that the new state says when the school has a yellow, the district has to provide support. Not some schools getting help and some schools not. And through your work, we're going to have OSS scale to work with the regions collaboratively to give schools the support they need. You're going to see more student progress finally in the SOL. It's not just the pass rate. It's where kids are and did they get better on the SOL test or on the WIDA test if they were English language learner. That is huge. We've been begging for that for the last, frankly, superintendents for the last 10, 10 15 years. There are gonna be less high school tests for high school kids, especially kids with the advanced studies diploma. Our advanced kids take a thousand tests. They're already in the advanced track. More tests isn't the way to de-stressing our children. So less tests for high school kids is in here. You do see though the state saying a higher bar for the GCI for graduation and a tighter definition for dropouts. So there's more flexibility around the testing, 
but there's a tighter accountability around graduation rate. Um, and I also thought a big nugget to say to the board, the gap that we've always done, the achievement gap is comparison one group to another is now comparison that group to the state benchmark. That is a sea change in thinking. Now, people have their own perspectives about it, but saying a benchmark instead of just a comparison from one group to another, I think is a key piece. The biggest grow we'd still like to see for some of our schools where we'll see a yellow, maybe even a red, hopefully not, is the science, particularly elementary school, but even across where that vocabulary in science and kids' ability to understand it has really been a trip up and we'd like to see the same flexibility around English for science. But overall, I think a lot more through your leadership and the work of this team, the state has recognized um, has recognized what Fairfax has been saying, and I think this is a step toward the vision of portrait of a graduate at the state level. So thank you, and thank you, Francisco, again, and your team. Great. Okay. Um, board members, uh, again, it was a lot to digest, but uh, right now I do have four um, colleagues who have indicated they wish to speak. I have Sandy Evans, followed by Ilion Moon, followed by Janie Strauss, followed by Elizabeth Schultz, and then I have Tim. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for this excellent presentation. And I just want to commend you for all the amazing work you've done. This is huge. You know, this is huge. You're, that, uh, and I know that um, our advocacy, your advocacy, has um, been a substantial part of, of why we've made these changes. And, and for the most part, they're positive changes. I do have uh, several questions. I did take a, a quick spin around the examples. and. Uh, have gotten a sense of where this is is probably going to lead us, but have you uh, calculated how many of our schools would have reds um, under the, you know, uh, under the current? On that command on the page, the web page where those reports are listed, there is a link at the top. Um, there are three hyperlinks before oh, you get to the region breakdowns. Okay. The last one is a summary page that okay. gives you um, I miss that. a picture. Okay. Of just a summary of the schools that have reds and then the schools who are yellows but may have achievement gap areas internally, some of those um, reporting groups that are red within the yellow overall. So you can see that breakdown there. The school names are not listed there, but that is something that could potentially be provided as well. And there are 11 total FCPS that have reds that have one or more red. Oh, okay. I will note the 11 include our five schools that currently have an alternative accreditation plan. So remember, these examples were run not to indicate actual accreditation right. status, but I rather understand. to give us a sense of how the calculations work. Mm -hmm. So they did run these even on our schools that have alternative accreditation plans. Those alternative accreditation plans will stand for the duration of the five-year approval period that they're currently operating under. However, the new calculations will be operating behind the scenes, and the data that they're asked to present on a year-to-year -year basis will need to reflect how they're performing on that. Yeah, so there were 11 that had accredited with conditions, which you described, and then there are 35 that have one or more that are considered accredited. Because remember, if you're, you're right. accredited, if you have um, if you have even one red, it doesn't matter about the color, it's about whether or not you are making progress, progress in those okay. areas. So it's 35 of our schools that would be considered accredited have one or more red, and 11 who would be credited with conditions, which is what um, Beatrice was just describing. Okay, uh, well, thank you. And I, you know, the two things that um, we're really gonna have to watch for are, uh, as you've pinpointed, the, the absenteeism, that's, that's new. And um, I would think that's something, it's good that we are addressing that, we do need to address that. Um, and and how, how are we doing that? Uh, what, what are we doing to help those schools? Because there, there are some schools that, uh, how many do we have now who are um, in the yellow or in the red on chronic absenteeism? I'm going to ask Marianne Penderoli to come up. Her and her team, again, have been taking the lead on looking at that, and she's here to provide us some updates on that. 
So we do not have any schools that are in the red except okay. for the five schools that have alternative accreditation plans already. Okay. Um, and again, remember those are like Key and Kilmer right. and mm -hmm. the alternative schools where okay. we know we have kids with high absentee issues. Okay. Um, in terms of the number who have yellow, that's not right readily at my fingertips. Okay. I'm not sure exactly. We do have um, a plan for working with schools that have, even though they would not be necessarily yellow or red, if there are 10% or more of the student body has chronic absenteeism, we've developed sort of a tiered system somewhat like what um, you'll see with this, the support office where we are um, working directly with the schools to work more on understanding what their data is, looking at it, and then coming up with, with plans to address that are individualized to each school. Okay. So, well, thank you. Uh, uh, that's something for us to be watching, too. I would like to get a, a, a somewhat better sense about the uh, English language learners. Did I understand you to say that, um, and, and of course, the, the the SIFs are something that we've, we've wanted to address for a long time, so I'm glad that we've gotten uh, a better understanding um, since we educate a, a third of Virginia's English language learners. So if the English language learner is progressing on the WIDA, then they, then they don't count against the school. Is that correct? Do I have that right? That is correct. The state has developed a progress table. It's dependent on the student's grade level okay. and the student's prior year overall composite score on their WIDA Access for Ls. So they must have two consecutive years of WIDA Access for L results, mm -hmm. and they must show the adequate amount or greater of growth on that progress table. Again, that progress table is linked within the presentation. Okay, well that's great, that, that, that is huge. It does only count for the English combined rate, Dr. Drown reminded me, does not currently count for mathematics, and as Dr. Brabrand pointed out, it does not count for, ma for science. Okay, so we still have an issue with, with those, all right. Um, and then my last question is about the dropout rate. You know, in, in looking at some of the specifics, I, I do see some that are, um, green for graduation rates but but red for dropout rates so could you help us understand why is that not just the reverse why is it not just graduation is one thing and and the uh, the rest is is dropout so as I indicated in the graduation completion index is a weighted calculation right. it gives full 100 points for each student that earns a diploma, but it additionally gives partial points, the 75 for a GD, the 70 for still in school, 25 for certificate of completion. So schools can earn partial points for students who did not graduate but are making that progress. And those count, the GEDs now count as dropouts? They do not drop oh. count as dropouts. However, that um, the GCI additionally is built on a a cohort that includes the sliders for English learners and students with disabilities. Okay. The, the dropout rate uses a different cohort group and it's a four-year cohort only. So if students are unaccounted for after that fourth year, then they're not going to be able to count toward the school. So it is a more rigorous, in a sense, um, and making sure I'm not saying that incorrectly, um, there are some of the details about that dropout and the difference that we're still trying to clarify with the state because um, it is basically a different cohort group that's being looked at for the GCI calculation as compared to the dropout calculation. And I would think we would still have the, the problem with students that we literally cannot find um, and I know some of our schools have a real issue with that, that they may be someplace getting an education, but we just can't find them. And um, so uh, that, that's... Yeah, that's correct. That still would be counted as a dropout. Right. We All were right. not able to account for them or where they were. Okay. Well, thank you for your excellent work on this. Okay. Uh, next up, we have Il Young Moon, followed by Cheney, followed by Elizabeth. Okay. I, I am not going to ask 15 questions. I'm being mindful of the desire to end this within by 12.30, right? Correct? That's the goal. That's the goal. Okay, thank you. Well, I, my first question goes to uh, graduation requirements. A new requirement about, I think you, you tried to explain that earlier in your presentation about sequential electives for the advanced studies diploma. Uh, if a 26 credits are required, among those 26, there are some electives included, correct? 
Are you referring to those electors among those 26 to be sequential? Yes. So how many uh, uh, electives are included in that 26? In the 26, there should be three electives. Three electives. Right. And I think your one example you gave us was world language, but world language is not elective, correct? It it is. A, it is an elective. It is those it's three. Not, but it's but it's a little bit it's a little bit different. So with the advanced studies diploma students are required to earn three credits in one world language or two credits in or one two plus two, or the right? Two plus two option, correct? So what we're still working with. The state to clarify would be, so let's take an example. So let's say a student did Spanish one through three, they counted that towards their world language requirement. Could the student then use Spanish four and five as their sequential elective? And our guess mm. would probably be yes, but we are working with the state to clarify that. Okay. And I use that, but like I said, a better example would have been like steam engineering to advance steam engineering okay. because of the nuances as it relates to our language. Just trying to so see I, whether there I are, did whether, share whether, that, but it has a nuance. Whether to it. we offer in high schools, whether we offer enough sequential electives for the students to do. In a sequential elective. Absolutely, I think we do. Whether it's in uh, fine and performing arts or in career and technical education, we have a plethora of options for okay. students. Okay. Another question with that new graduation requirements, AP, IB, Honor, CT, is that ones we normally understand to be AP courses, IP courses, is that is that nothing more than just taking one of those courses? Is Correct. that the requirement? Correct. Correct. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, that was about the graduation. And that 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 index we're talking about, uh, what was it, graduation composite index? GCI. GCI, yeah. GCI. Certificate of completion. Could you just clarify what that is? Certainly, yeah. The certificate of completion um, is an option available for students if they meet all of the uh, standard course credit requirements, but they're unable for whatever reason to meet the verified credits towards a standard diploma. Um, I it see. Is, right. So they're able to, if the student has determined that they're they're going to be finished and that they're going to be, be leaving the school and not returning to try to finish out those verified credits, they could earn a certificate of completion. The certificate of completion is not a diploma and is not recognized as such. Do you have a lot of students taking, you know, getting just certificates of completion? Uh, not not as many as you might think. We really try to encourage those students to continue to come back either through the summer or even into the next year um, to work on remediation plans to then be able to successfully complete the verified credit assessments. Okay. Uh, yes. We really want students to earn that diploma. And if you look at the GCI calculations, you see we, were, we are rewarded for that. Mm -hmm. So the certificate of completion, when a student ends with that and says, I'm going on, I have the next plan, whether it's in a different state or a different country or just another plan, that's the 25 points, but we want all of our students to come back and get to that diploma, and if they're still enrolled, they get 75 points for okay, it. Okay, so let me have a little bit of understanding of students who are continuing with the 70 points they get, is that you're looking at students who have been with us for four years, freshman year to senior year, and have not graduated, but still trying to graduate by continuing those they get 70 points correct unless they're english learners or students with disabilities okay. who are granted more time to graduate from the state and they are just excluded from calculation they they're what we call sliders so they literally slide into the next year's cohort into the following year right so those students who are to not belong to ELLs or special education right you know students but who are continuing haven't quite gotten there yet Correct. just get 70 points but if they eventually graduate let's say in the following year mm -hmm. they are not calculated they are not in the calculation at all uh, in the following year in the, in the following year. year they're part of the five and six year calculations yes they're in the part of the five six year calculation right so they pick up their full hundred points correct in the in the following yeah. year yes okay okay now I'm gonna go to uh, uh, just a uh, uh, human gaps seven subgroups the state benchmark do I understand that for seven subgroups we have uniform benchmark not different benchmarks, right? Correct, it is a, a standard benchmark, regardless of reporting group against which they are measured. The combined rate is applied for each of those reporting groups separately 
to then determine a level one green, level yellow, level two yellow, or level three so, red for each. So looking at looking at each subgroup, seven groups, if any one of those subgroups get, let's say, level below level one, like a level two or level three, do, does the entire school get the level two or three? I see, I see. More than one group at the level three, level three. Okay, that's, that's the overall. Correct. And the, the linked um, matrix that I had directly linked yeah. on another slide, that gives you even more detail as to how that okay. works. I know we're not talking about ESSA today, but under ESSA, but we still look at the subgroups, achievement gaps among the subgroups, yes. because yes. you know this board is committed to uh, yes. reduce and eliminate yes. those achievement gaps, but state is going different directions. The Actually, this methodology to apply each reporting group against a standard benchmark came from the federal methodology. So the state actually adopted this from the rules that were in place under the ESEA waiver that was in effect for a, a number of years before this ESSA transition. So this is actually adopted from the federal methodology and was one of the efforts of the state to better align the two systems. Okay. Okay, one last question, question has to do, uh, nothing to do with today's presentation, but since I sent in my question in advance, uh, I'm gonna go to this one. Uh, related to a graduation requirements, whether I understand that we do already have an options not to require 990 hours of a seat time for students on credit, but how many schools or how many students are actually taking advantage of that. In terms of the waiver of the clock hours? Yes. Um, we have a few options in FCPS where students are um, doing things like taking economics and personal finance through a self-directed um, course where they're able to, once they've mastered those standards, um, uh, be able to earn that credit. We have students who are able to take an independent study elective course, um, which again, um, they can structure their time um, as they go through. Um, I don't have exact numbers. Okay, would you be able to get those numbers from? Because because I'm asking this because, uh, you know, I mean, I had two sons gone through our schools here, and you know, some of the courses rather than sitting entire year, they could have they could have finished those courses in one semester or three quarters and use the other two quarters or one quarter for something else for more beneficial use. And I'm looking at especially for you know second semester, high school senior years, you know, why do they try to provide our students with uh, some other opportunities, even including work related, actually do some work outside in the real world before they go to college for a quarter or full semester, some internships. Others. I, mean, I am trying to see whether our board with you guys can have some meaningful discussion about that area. Not today, but this is something for my board, you know, my colleagues conservation and your exploration. Thank you. Yeah, and we are coming back to the board. The team is coming back to the board at a future work session on high school pathways and some of those other things. So we can bring that back to that discussion as well. Great, thank you, Mr. Moon. Uh, I have Janie followed by Elizabeth followed by Tammy. Okay, thank you very, very much. I really, I've been waiting to get this analysis because tremendous effort and good work has has resulted because of our advocacy, other schools throughout the state. Dr. Staples, I think, has been um, a fabulous leader for Virginia. So. Thank you all very much for this very detailed report and for all of the hot links so that we can kind of see how this actually impacts individual schools. So I really appreciate that. Okay, questions. First of all, um, uh, and particularly the slide that is up now, the state looking at um, uh, achievement gaps based on a standard. Um, this is so important because otherwise we are constantly chasing um, issues that we cannot alone solve. Kids come with different challenges, different assets every year, it's a different group of kids, different group of parents, and um, uh, 
by being able to look at that constant line there, it is up to us to make sure that we have equity of opportunity, fidelity of implementation, not that we can somehow control for other sometimes cultural or, uh, chal or assets in life that some kids come with. That's wonderful. And by taking this approach, it also, I hope, then for public schools that is less decisive, less um, negative aspect of, well, this group of children is now within my boundary attendance area and this is going to pull us down, blah, blah. We're public schools, we take all children. So it's our job to help all of those kids, not to allow situations where we're keeping children out. So I really, really appreciate this as the lens from which we will look at um, our gaps in achievement. So I think it places our responsibility where it belongs as a public school. So I'm delighted to see that. Um, uh, the My next question on um, um, project-based learning, history, social studies, opportunities, how is that going to um, work our way through with the state? Um, I was at one of my middle schools that does a great job with project-based learning. I was at Cooper last Friday. How will this then, how will the, the process of accepting these alternative assessments and how's that going to work with the state? Because clearly we're not there yet, right? Sure. And, you know, this is new. Again, it's, it's um, coming into effect for next fall. And the state has promised that very soon they will be putting out a superintendent's memo to detail that process. I believe they are still working out some of those details. So I, I think for today I'll answer that we will stay tuned. We know that we have um, within Fairfax, our instructional services team has been laying a lot of groundwork um, with schools. As you said, many of our schools are already on this path. So um, we are working with those schools to make sure we have pieces in place so that we can take advantage of this opportunity when we do get those details. Right. Because Ms. Huffman, just one uh, piece that I would add to that is we've actually been working this spring with representatives from each of the high schools um, to get ready for this new um, assessment process. So we've already begun working with them to think about issues of inter rater reliability in terms of the assessments and the scoring, um, consistency and coherence around task design. So we're in pretty good shape. We just really need that guidance from the state in terms of what their expectations are gonna be. Right, again, this is something that a lot of us have advocated for for years. And finally, the pendulum has swung. And but, the inter-rater reliability, all of the making sure that the project-based learning activities are legitimate and are a true assessment of what students have done. So, I'm very pleased to see where we are with that. The absence piece is my understanding that with the increased emphasis on attending school, I know that we tend to have high rates of absenteeism among our youngest children. Um, the little babies that start in kindergarten and first grade, they run a fever. It's, I mean, this just for the experience of viruses with little kids. But, and then sometimes parents feeling that it's not as important for the little ones to get to school. So that's kind of, that's why I assume that that's one of our targets is looking at helping our youngest kids to try to be in school. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And in terms of, again, um, students who have chronic illness, for the kids who are getting home-based instruction, obviously that counts. Kids who are in the hospital and getting using our teachers, that counts. Yes. So this is basically, we're counting the kids who are simply not there and the parents have not reached out for the resources we can provide. Correct. Okay. So um, we've already talked somewhat about the graduation requirements and the kids that we can't count because we don't know where they've come. So where are we with the state with all of that? Where do you think we're going to get to on that one? When we lose kids, we have no idea where they are. Yeah, right now the state has just, I mean, they've given us a little bit of flexibility. We worked with some advocacy around when we can look on social media where we might see students have gone. So we, they've allowed us to make a little bit, but ultimately they're really clear about if we don't know and we cannot find where a student has gone, then they would be considered to be a dropout. I know we've had... Ms. Evans and I have had many conversations about that, but that's been the only somewhat of flexibility they've given us as it relates to social media. 
But um, that's been the main thing. So what we've had to do and what I think the team has done an amazing job on is work with our school leaders, our uh, system principals, our counselors to help them understand and the systems that we have for tracking students and catch them right away if they leave. Because if we know a student leaves and then we wait until the end of the year to try and find them, it's much more difficult than if they left recently and we can try and track them down. Try. It's also very difficult in some cases. We have schools that actually get in their car and drive to places of employment where they've heard they're working, uh, drive to Maryland looking for them in someone, a neighbor, a family's member's house. I mean, so our schools go above and beyond to try and identify the, uh, the students that are no longer showing up. But it's the biggest challenge we have. So the state has said at the end of the day, you still have to know where they are. Um, and then just giving us a little bit of flexibility, but not much with social media. Okay. Well, yeah. social media, that's an interesting flexibility. Yeah. Okay. Um, dual enrollment, I know that we have been working on partnerships with, um, with NOVA. And where are we? Because those dual enrollment courses, it has to do with accreditation and licensure for teachers and content of courses. So where are we? We're going to be, again, we'll be coming back with about some of the high school pathways and that expansion piece. I don't know if... If you want to add anything now, Sloan, but I mean, that's part of what we're going to be talking about when we come back, some of the dual enrollment options and some ability for our students to take additional courses. It doesn't really relate necessarily to this, but we will be updating you more on that, I think, in the next month. I'm not sure. Is it next month? Yeah. Right, because I know we've been working on that for some years, and we've made a lot of good progress with that. I'd just love to know where we are. Um, the other part is uh, work-based learning opportunities, and back in 2007, 2008, when we had to um, uh, restrict some of the um, contracts with our high school teachers and we shortened contract days and weeks with some of the teachers who are supervising work-based learning. So if we are hoping to provide more um, work-based learning, what are we gonna, how, where are we with having staff? Because they do have to be supervised. Yes, and some of the provisions in, as it relates to that in the SOA speaks to it can range from career days, industry representative visits from the workplace coming to elementary schools, internships, job shadowing. So it allows for us to expand that a little bit within the SOA, what the requirements are. And so I know our team is looking at that. How do we partner with some of our businesses, bringing some into the elementary level the job shadowing piece? So we're looking at what that means long term. And that particular area as relates to the um, CC, CCRI piece of the SOA does have some time for us to, we're still getting some, as, as we said about the few other areas, we're still getting from the state what are the expectations in terms of how we will document that. But what we do know, what, what we've heard thus far, is a couple of those activities can count. And those are things that the team has been working on. And then from our perspective in staffing, CTE teachers or business teachers who are overseeing some of that because it means that we have to have enough of our own staff um, sort of at the highest level is, is what happens with TJ and their partnership. But looking at each high school staff that will actually help arrange, supervise, visit the work site, et cetera. Yeah, we'll, we're looking at some of those things. And again, I think when we come back with our high school pathway expansion uh, discussion, you can hear a little bit more about the planning for that and the challenges for that, because there are certainly challenges as it relates to that. So we, we definitely can, can and will continue what those uh, needs are, ideas are, and some of the limitations as it relates to that. Right. Okay, that covers my questions. Again, thank you very much. I'm, I really appreciated this in-depth um, presentation and the hot links. That's very important. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Strauss. Um, Ms. Schultz? Hi. So I have a number of questions, um, if I can. Um, can we start on page uh, slide 13? Um, <clears throat> the question about the WIDA, um, and I've asked this previously, um, that students who pass an SOL but don't pass the WIDA don't advance in um, their ELL levels. Have we fixed that yet? Because there's a disparity between passing, I mean, it, it, it's a, you know, an anachronism that they're passing the SOLs and not the WIDA. So the two assessments measure very different things. Um, I will need to look at data to see where we have 
evident, you know, where we have examples of students who are passing their standards of learning tests um, and are not showing progress on the WIDA access for ELLs, there could be a, a number of reasons um, for not having an overall composite level on the access for ELLs, which would be um, kind of indicative of, of what you're representing, not being able to show growth. One example would be if they're not able to complete all four of the components of that assessment, then they would not receive an overall composite level and would not be determined to show growth. Yeah, I, I've had this expressed as a concern by um, teachers um, frustrated on behalf of their students that feel like the WIDA is unnecessary, an unnecessary barrier at that point, that they feel like the students are progressing and that they're demonstrating um, progress in both the academic grades and the SOLs, but that somehow the WIDA is a, you know, a hurdle too high. So I, I would like um, for that to be, uh, you know, um, evaluated. Um, if we could go to slide 14, can you explain a little bit more this combined rate ma matrix? Because I'll, t I'll tell you just, you know, from what's here, um, it sounds like we're compressing the performance levels of each group into a higher um, more o overarching uh, performance as opposed to keeping it at each subgroup. And that, I, that I, is an accurate assessment, yes. Yeah, well, that, that's, um, unfortunately, that looks like it's a way to cover weaknesses. This is one reason why our Office of School Support and our um, data tools that we're developing are very specifically keeping the individual progress for each of those reporting groups as part of the reporting for us to use internally so that we can continue to monitor and keep our eyes on those so that they don't um, go so they're not that they're not masked by this this compilation that you're describing who who, who came up with this the state this was the state board of education okay well i i predict this is a very bad this is not good um this is not helpful and this will be used to suppress um, areas of weakness. So I'm throwing down my marker here. We'll advance a year, and I'll say, remember when I said. So that's uh, the next. Ms. Schultz, if I could just add one piece, because I, I think this is a great conversation. It's going to overlap, I think, with some of our conversation when we have the goal one report um, after lunch. And one thing I would just remind the board is here we're looking at that external accountability standard, and you've, you've characterized it completely accurately. Another thing we're going to have an opportunity to do as a board, though, is when we continue to work on the streamlined strategic plan, is set our own performance targets for internal accountability. Um, so I think that's a conversation we'll continue to have over the coming weeks. That's precisely weeks. what I want to get to, which is, I, uh, in some respects, I don't really care what the state is measuring. If we're aware that what the state is doing is the height of mediocrity or less than that, we have to be better than the, the, the mediocrity um, set by the state. Yeah. Francisco, isn't it true when the state did the federal AMOs, they took performance of all the subgroups on the test, and then they set the benchmarks based on each of those subgroups' performance, which were all over the place. Mm -hmm. The feedback yes. they got then was, from groups, the NAACP in particular at the state level, you set the AMO down here. This is a target across all the subgroup and it's being measured to that target. So yeah. honestly, I know what you're saying, but I actually think the state is trying to correct what they had done earlier, which was setting up different measures based on the subgroup's prior performance on a test. Anytime, anytime we roll up, multiple groups into a combined, I mean, it says it right there, a combined rate matrix, that um, early warning detection flag. Okay. okay, can we go to slide 15? Who advocated that we are no longer going to measure at a state level accreditation um, for history and social science. I want to get it on the record. I, I do not recall specific individuals who advocated for this. I do know that in general, we know that English, math, and science are required by federal um, 
accountability for measuring and that history was always additional for the state level only. So I believe that the rationale for encouraging this to be removed was again to better align with the federal accountability system and also to allow for that internal and performance-based measure of students' performance toward their assessment. Okay. And as Francisco also pointed out, the, the SOL tests will remain as an expectation for students as part of their um, fourth grade, eighth grade, and verified credit. Okay. This is more disastrous than the former. Um, when we, when we, first of all, when we capitulate to whatever the federal government is me measuring, for for the love of Pete, people, we um, seriously, um, I, I don't want to use. Not only do I not want to settle for what the state's uh, measuring, I definitely don't want to settle for what the federal government is uh, measuring in terms of uh, academic achievement for our students. We are we are saying affirmatively that we will no longer at the federal or state level, or we're never at the federal level, um, holding accountable school systems for teaching history. For the love of Pete, I mean, do we need to be more Orwellian? I, I just, I'm, I'm stunned. So like the, the former, I, I expect us to be accountable, at least ourselves. Um, I don't even know what to say to this one. Can we go to slide 17, please? Been a lot of talk um, prior to, and I don't want to delve into this too much, but um, chronic absenteeism. Um, I did hear that it's five schools. We know I didn't really are in the red. I have no data. I have no data in context. I don't know out of 189 and a half thousand students, how many we're talking. Are we talking 2,000 students, 1,000 students, 500 students, 12 students? Um, not that this isn't important, but on the scale of a school division, what I don't want is for us to focus only on the thing that is at the bottom that affects a very few number of people and elevate that when we've just said, eh, we're not going to be accountable on history, and oh, by the way, we're going to roll other things up. So n not that this isn't important, but I don't want us to lose sight of the fact that this, to get tunnel vision on this. And I th do think it would be helpful um, when we have something like this to, again, have the data in context of what, what, what percentage of our students are we really talking about, and how do we like Mr. Greenfelder has done in the past, how do you provide targeted resources to a targeted problem in targeted locations with targeted students as opposed to elevating that to something that's a system-wide problem? It's not, it's not a system-wide problem. I suspect it's a very narrow a focus problem involving um, particular students in particular schools in particular regions of the, the division, and therefore it's going to require a particular set of um, uh, solutions driven to just that one thing. And I've, I've been in a school during a performance improvement plan development and talked about it, and it requires us saying some things bravely that you know are, are difficult to talk about. And that is absolutely the approach that we are taking. Um, you'll hear a little bit more about that when we do the SR&R presentation because it's next steps in there, and at that time I can be sure to bring you the total number of kids who fall into the issue. Um, for us, part of the issue, and the reason again, it's sort of what FCPS standard is versus what the state has said. I mean, if you had a quarter of your kids who are missing more than 10% of the school year, which is what it takes to get into the red, that's going to be you know, hundreds of kids. Um, who are being impacted at one school. So what we have set our criteria in terms of um, supports and interventions with school is at the 10% mark. So if you have more than 10% of your kids, um, because again, if you're looking at a high school, you're talking about 200 kids at, two, at a school of 2,000. Um, you know, we felt like that was a, the point at which we needed to do interventions. Right. And I, I can imagine at a federal level, you know, again, we just returned from NSBA and, you know, we sit with superintendents who are superintendents of a thousand school, a thousand students. I have a thousand students in my elementary school. So, I mean, it, you know, it's not comparable. And so what I don't want to do is get us lost in the weeds. I, not that I don't want to direct the resources, but 
but we need to call a spade a spade. If I could, this is one under ESSA. Francisco, correct me. That's just when I'm wrong, please. Please, I want you to. Under ESSA, the states had to pick an additional indicator, non-academic. Non -academic. The state and the Board of Education of the oh, state this. went round and round and round on this, but they landed on this. Superintendents had mixed feelings about this. Right. I want you to know that, Ms. Schultz. They really did. Unintended consequences. Who are we going to target now? But um, we're, we said we're going to work in good faith with the state. We're going to work in good faith with this board. Not overdo it, not underdo it, report it, and really, like Mary Ann said, even come up with a lower number. We've had attendance folks looking at issues in our schools for years and years. The nugget here is it's not just unexcused. That's been our focus historically in Fairfax. It's excused absences. So that's going to be a little bit of the tweak about the habit of encouraging kids to come to school on a regular basis. And there'll be some cultural pieces around equity where we have families that have traditionally left for several weeks at a time. So we'll work our way through it. It is one, though, it was not our advocacy that got this here. No. This one was decided by the state after extensive debate. And the we'll state, work with you to make it work. And the state, for good, bad, or indifferent, got a lot of advocacy from early childhood advocates and folks saying that when we see statewide a lot of um, attendance concerns around kindergarten students, that's why for good, bad, or indifferent, they chose to have this as the non-academic indicator to try and push that message to help build that as an expectation of accountability um, in hopes to make some inroads into what we saw at the early childhood level. I want to be mindful of the time. I have a couple more. Um, uh, slide 22. Um, the first one, and this is something Ms. McLaughlin and I in particular have been sort of relentless about, participation in advanced coursework versus how you perform in that advanced coursework. I, I think the most useless measure we've ever talked about, and I see Mr. Carlson over there on the old OEs, um, was the number of kids who took an AP class or an IV class. Who cares? How'd they do? How'd they do? That's, the, that's actually something worth measuring. So on again on you know if this is the state measure so be it i think the expectation of this board should be a correlation between who's enrolled and how they do what's the grade what grade do they get on the test and how does that correlate to the grade they achieve in the classroom because if they're getting fives but they're getting a c in the classroom there's a problem if they're enrolled and they're failing the class and they're failing the test, who cares that they were enrolled? That was an unsuccessful enrollment. So I think there has to be a correlation. So that's just a statement. I don't need anything on that one. And I think potentially the last one in the interest of time, slide 24. And Mr. Moon had um, touched on this. This one is very, to me, is particularly upsetting. And let me tell you why. Um, in the time that I spend with the, the kids in the student town halls, um, and, and this is this is an elevating problem. Our kids are unbelievably stressed, unbelievably stressed. And I thought that we were going to get some advocacy around potentially relieving um, uh, athletes of a PE requirement, not the health requirement, but the PE requirement. And I still think we should be doing that to free up the time in the classroom of all the demands of the things that they think they're having to do to get into college, the, the checking the block, so that they can have time for electives. And now this is not only do you not buy back time, that if you take an elective, it now has to be sequential, so you have to now. Now there's achievement associated with an elective. The whole point of an elective is for them to be able to explore, maybe take a guitar class, a photography class, a journalism class, to explore being a learned individual. And now we're now setting new hurdles and new bars on even the electives. I think this is 
bad, B-A-D, bad. This does not help in the stress of our students. It does not help in having them explore things outside, like the hurdles of getting to college. They already feel like they're taking classes that they have absolutely no interest in, but they're just doing it to clear you know, the, the Fairfax penalty of how hard it is to get in college after graduating with, you know, the vast majority of the state's graduates. So I, I, I don't know where this came from or why or who thought this was a great idea, but I feel like it wasn't field tested. Um, and I, I think we're gonna get a lot of negative feedback from students that you now have to jump through hoops even on your electives. And, and not to, to agree or disagree, but just to give some other clarity to that, that component is just new for the advanced studies diploma because the standard are currently already have that requirement. I mean, I'm not, I know that's not, that's not um, necessarily responding to what you were saying in terms of the concern. The I just wanted to make a get an clarity. Diploma? I just wanted to clarify because that it, you were saying it's new in general. It's only new for those advanced. And, well, and again, that wasn't, that wasn't to, that wasn't to. Correct. I wanted to make the clarification of what Dr. Trent said. In our standard diploma, we were already requiring that to con sequential, uh, sequential elective. electives. So we actually already pinned them. Elevating the stress down. on the kids who are already getting advanced stress uh, advanced studies diploma was not necessary, in right, my opinion, is what I'm saying. No, and, and I, I would just say I think doing it to any student, standard or advanced, uh, is, right. is wrong. Uh, right, right. And that's, I wasn't commenting on that. I just wanted to bring clarity so that the board knew and that I everyone agree. knew it was not just new and, in general. And my parting comment is, um, Dr. Uh, Brabrand, you'd said um, on the fewer tests, how, how, how heavily the test, you know, they're, they're going to wind up being tested less. The thing is, is that we have the control over the vast majority of how much we assess students. And um, we continue to be in a position when I go into schools that students basically are receiving an assessment, if not uh, every class, at least every other class. And for a high school student, seven classes um, times every other class, 18 weeks. Yeah, I mean, the amount of assessing that we're doing is within our control. And I still think that that is something on grading, grading fidelity, and the amount of assessing that we're doing. We're assessing them to death. There's no time to actually learn. It's just clearing the next hurdle. We have taken, you know, a, a, a track athlete um, who clears a hurdle every, you know, 15 or 20 yards and compressed it to clearing one every five. And it, it, um, okay, the state's going to have some fewer tests at a state, you know, assessment level. Um, the real way that we improve, I think, learning and address the mental health and wellness aspect of what's going on with our students is to lighten that load ourselves. So that's my final. Thank you, Ms. Schultz. I have Ms. Darnett Koufax followed by uh, Ms. Corbett Sanders, and then Mr. Wilson and I will wrap up before we do next steps. Thank you so much. Um, most of my, all of my questions have been answered at this point. I think I will have some, I will go offline with you to talk about a little bit about the English and math achievement gaps and how that's going to work specifically, but I, I don't want to waste everybody's time. So, um, Ms. Huffman, if, if possible, uh, a next step for me would be you so eloquently described what was in these slides. And sometimes I think um, what I would like is I would like to have your talking points. Um, you know, uh, you can do it one pager, you can do it a 10 pager, you know, but but um, I think that's very, very helpful because as my as, as I was going through, I was trying to take notes and as my colleagues had similar questions to what I was, I understood it better. But I think if we had your talking points attached to this um, in ever, however you want to give those to us, that would be extremely helpful. Um, other comments made, um, Ms. Schultz, I was down, I happened to be in Richmond uh, many, several years ago when the history teachers were lobbying um, to keep um, the, uh, the, the SOL for um, history. 
And I think this is a be careful what you wish for. We were saying too many tests, too many tests, too many tests. And uh, this is what came off. Uh, if, you, if, you have, if you want less tests, you have to test less subjects. I do have a little bit of a concern. Uh, you know, I was alerted via social media this weekend that, you know, 41% of our millennials can't explain adequately what the Holocaust was. Um, so, so well, that was maybe a different study, but, um, you know, I think... Uh, I think what we have to be mindful of in Fairfax, and I know Dr. Duran and Sloan and Ms. Huffman, all of you who are involved, um, and you talk about this is the state standards. It doesn't mean it has to be Fairfax standards. And I think that's very, very important. I think if we are lessening the burden overall on our kids, that will help reduce the stress. But I think we have to be very mindful about what we are teaching as Fairfax. And, you know, that's what makes our system a premier school system. So we need to, we, we always have gone above and beyond and I think we need to continue to do that. So that would be um, something that I want to just highlight. And finally, um, you know, Ms. Panarelli and her team, um, they've reported a lot on this absentee problem was skipped and, um, you know, through that policy team, what we can do. Um, I think I know some of my schools, one of which is in the red, they do extraordinary things to get their kids. I mean, they have counselors dedicated to knocking on doors. And um, so system-wide, I think we need support for those. I, I think we need something like a public service, you know, like campaign, um, something like that, that really educates the parents. I think there are certain groups that when they're, they're new to the country, they don't understand the importance. So there's a cultural piece here as well that's missing that could be encapsulated in the public service campaign. And um, But I'm, I'm talking about additional funding because there is no standardized way to get um, help to those schools who we're seeing. We, we've seen chronic absenteeism in the same schools since I've been on the board, and I've been on the board seven years now. So, but system-wide, we have never provided extra supports for them. And if this is what's happening, um, you know, if this is a, a benchmark now, I think the schools that, that experience that, you know, those are two of my humble suggestions kind type of things. But... Um, you're, you're up here now if you want to speak to whatever else you're thinking, but also system-wide what we can be, what supports we can be providing. I think, I think that you are absolutely correct, and it is like in any of the areas that we look. Our first step has to be at the universal um, instruction, if you will, for parents in this case and for community members about the importance of regular attendance. We are working very closely with a variety of county agencies um, both on developing that communication plan, and that was part of why we put into the slide for yourselves, here's something you can put in your newsletter, here's uh, oh, talking that's, points that's for great. you. Um, but beyond that, we're looking at beyond different languages, different sort of approaches with different cultures. And we've done, we've gone as far as geomapping where the kids with chronic absenteeism are so that our um, neighborhood and community service partners, our partners in opportunity neighborhoods and some of the other areas have individuals who are willing to, I can't tell them this child is chronically absent, but I can say within this four block area, there's a high concentration of kids who are chronically absent and they are willing to go door to door to every house or every apartment within that complex and provide information in two languages and have conversations with parents about what is the actual reason why their kid is not attending. And so we're, we're trying to marshal our community resources, if you will, in the targeted way where we know we have individual schools or even if a school itself is falling, say, in the yellow and not in the red, it may be that they have a large percentage of kids who live in a particular area. So we're, we're trying to marshal those. We're also working with the health department so that if we find that there are a high number of excused absences due to asthma or due to allergies or whatever within a concentrated area, we can look at what are the environmental situations going on in that area. So we're looking at it pretty broadly, but it starts certainly with messaging to people that this is important. Because again, we have people who are, are just making decisions um, about when it's convenient to do something or another that perhaps they could make a different decision. Right. Well, thank you. I have, I, that, 
I remember hearing that and, and thank you again for sharing it with this group because I think that's that's the best way to start and um, you know Ms. Panarelli that uh, that anyway this board can help you know as as you go forward to see what we need to do and and you know if you want to work with uh, the particular school board members where you're, they're seeing that and whatever else just just to keep us surprised I would appreciate that well and, and certainly you know in terms of resources and we've said this for a number of years we've been trying as our attendance officers retire to replace them with attendance specialists who are social work background or similar um, because the work has changed over time um, and um, and we have 15 of them for 188,000 kids um, and so again that will be an area that we continue to sort of advocate for uh, Ms. Panarelli, or Dr. Panarelli, I wanted to check something first, you, something you said. Um, if we know that there are individuals, where, or within the individuals, we know that they live in an area where there's the high absenteeism, we don't have a way through FERPA or otherwise, through school staff then, to, to target going to the specific homes. And the reason I'm saying that is you could have a neighborhood with a lot of families and we're gonna knock on nine out of 10 doors where nine of them, it's not an issue at all just to find the one. Um, that just seems like not an efficient use of county services. Again, it, under FERPA, we cannot give out student information to other groups. Um, there is a lot of outreach that is from direct schools, so from school social workers calling, from those sorts of things that are calling directly to those families. What we do know is where we have high concentrations of kids who have absenteeism problems, it is actually very beneficial to have everybody in that neighborhood aware of the fact that we are all working together, whether they have a child or not who is, is having difficulty because, especially in the neighborhoods where we have been looking, there is a lot of um, caretaking that's done by neighbors and just engagement that's done by neighbors. So the grandma in the apartment complex actually will talk to kids if they see them out of school during school hours, et cetera. So we have seen, um, we, we don't have any data yet to say that you know this is a beneficial approach, but as we've looked across the country, it is an approach that's been used in other areas, and so we thought we would give it a try. Ms. Koufax, do you have any more questions? Okay, um, Ms. Corbett Sanders. Sure, and I'll try to make this brief. Um, I do want to echo the concerns that both uh, Ms. Schultz and Ms. Koufax uh, reiterated about the um, history if we don't learn our history, we repeat our history. And so I would urge that we look at this as the floor and not the ceiling and um, really reiterate with all of the schools the importance of continuing concentration because my fear is that when we diminish the expectations on science in elementary schools, we saw what happened um, as a knock-on effect for all of our kids in mastery of science. And now if you see a similar thing with history, we will have a similar trend. And so um, I would urge that we as a school system maintain a very high expectation for all of our students to have a mastery of um, their history. Especially, you know, one of the things I tell people is that, especially with newcomers coming to our um, schools, that it's really important for them to understand, um, as I say, uh, Virginia history is U.S. history and U.S. history is world history. So let's make sure we keep that focus. Uh, similarly, the uh, communications piece that um, Ms. Staranak Koufax spoke about is critical, and it's critical not only for absenteeism, but for all of the metrics. And it would be very helpful if, um, as a follow-on action, we had a um, communications plan for the new standards of accreditation and break out that communications plan into the role of the school, the local level, the system-wide level, board expectations, and then go beyond that because I do think, especially in the area of chronic absenteeism, that it will be very important 
to have a clear understanding, not only by the messaging uh, from the school system, but ha partnering with our faith-based community, our, um, uh, our faith-based community, our chambers of commerce, as well as the um, uh, the local PTA and the regional PTA. And so I would like to have as a follow on a clear, um, more than just a community kit for the school communities, but a full fledged, how are we gonna do that? Including the public service, the board of supervisors role, et cetera. Um, and then on chronic absenteeism, one of the things that I've learned with a number of our schools at the middle level, middle school level in particular, um, students oversleep, they miss the bus. And so a um, clear communication about the availability of the connector school bus passes and getting that out and repeating that communication throughout the year, I think will address some of the chronic absenteeism, um, but it's gonna be important. Uh, Additionally, um, in going through uh, the document, um, some of the concerns I've had in then doing the hot link to how our various schools perform um, is that we've, you know, once again, I've mentioned this before, we've clustered some of our highest need schools in just a couple of regions, including listing as part of our region some of our non-regional schools as being part of the region. So it sends a message that the whole region has an issue, but if you actually go through, you learn that you know the alternative schools are all included into that regional um, description. And so it may send a message. And so I would urge that when we're doing things like this, that we pull out all of our non-regional schools into the non-regional um, section rather than clustering them in region three and others. Um, because it does. Thank you for that. I, I, I organize them based on the way that they're listed on the school profiles. So I will go back and check with the communications office to confirm the way in which those non-traditional schools are or are not assigned to regions. Um, I, my understanding is that they are in fact assigned to regions with the exception of the Fairfax Adult Fairfax County Adult High School, um, for instance, Bryant Alternative. They are assigned Correct. to regions, but the students don't all come from that region. And so then it sends, it communicates that that region has issues or may have issues when, um, you know, the kids come from beyond, they come from all over the county. You can certainly so go back and reorganize them into a separate, I, I mean, because technically they are under the regions, but to your point, students come from different places. So we can categorize them in the listing as being non-regional in that aspect. Well, that's okay. I'd be fine with that. And that's more for, I think, communication because right. none of the accountability is done by the region level in terms of, but it's just how it's messaged, I think is what you're Correct. saying. Correct. Yeah. It's part Because we don't calculate anything for this, at least it relates to this right. um, around regional. But we then communicate it as a region. So Correct. So we'll message it. it differently for you to make sure okay. it's Thank avoided. You. Um, and then the other piece that I'm a little concerned about is the how all of those alternative schools impact the four-year graduation piece. Because that's a metric we're going to so, be. So do so, we get any carve-out going f forward? It doesn't the, look like it. The, the five schools that have alternative accreditation plans, as Betra said, will stay under their alternative accreditation plan for um, until the they of their for their tenure of their plan, and then we'll have to resubmit new plans, which will probably have to be altered to have something to do with attendance, et cetera. But right now, they're under what they were under before. Right. Those those are not all alternative schools. That includes um, Key Center, Kilmer Center. Right. Um, but they are schools that have unusual populations of kids. In terms of the alternative high schools, they are, they are evaluated unto themselves. In other words, they don't impact other schools' accreditation because 
because all their scores and everything stay with them as a high school. The thing I think that you might be thinking of is that the non-traditional programs, not schools, so if a kid is at um, a transitional resource center or is at an alternative learning center, their scores, as they always have with SOLs or whatever, roll back to their school. Right, and I would suggest that those are things that we might want to look at as um, future initiatives working with the state so that we don't, you know, we don't roll back the scores from TJ, we don't roll back the scores from other programs. So um, it, it's kind of a double edged sword. I would just suggest that that would be a future to advocacy. Look at. Sure. Um, and then let's see, there was one addition. Oh, on the um, the electives, and I've got two questions on um, if you look at page, hold on a second, slide 24, the verified and the new requirements, the sequential electives. Question is, do, you know, we have the one math verified credit. The sequential electives is when our ch children go beyond the math obligation. Can those be used as sequential electives? No. I don't believe so. Okay, so it's only in the non-core four that they can yes. be counted as sequential electives? That's correct. Okay. From my understanding, but we're... We, we were still getting some clarity on that. So right now I would say no, but we're still getting some clarity. So we'll. I would think that would be one that we would want to look at because if a student wants to um, go well beyond in some of these areas, then they should be, uh, that should be a plus. It shouldn't be a, uh, okay, a we can, negative. We can bring back some more clarity on that. Okay, that would be great. And then um, it, the it, the math verified credit for high school. If a child has taken algebra in seventh grade and geometry in eighth grade, that will count towards their high school or no? Yes and no. Yes, it counts for their verified credit. Okay. No, it does not fulfill their requirement to test once in mathematics in grades 9 through 12. The state has also promised a superintendent's memo coming shortly to clarify specifically for mathematics, but also to extend to other content areas, some of the kind of intricacies of how these new expectations will play out in different scenarios for different students. Um, but again, there was a twofold expectation for students. There is um, the requirement that they test in grades nine to 12, and there is a requirement that they earn their verified credit. They may have earned their verified credit before they reached high school. So they, they will have, have to expected. do a test. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, that's very helpful to know. And when that memo comes out, please let us know because we'll want to be able to speak to our constituents about that. Sure. Um, and along the same lines, are we at all concerned or we have, have we gamed out the impact of uh, minimizing the number of verified credits because oftentimes we have um, actually used those verified credits as a way of boosting the scores for individual schools. But if you have these kids not taking those, do we know, have we gamed out what the impact will be and have actually pro, um, proactively worked with those schools to be aware that they need to um, address these concerns before they become a reality? So not yet fully, though that work is underway. That is certainly an area um, that has been noted both at the state level, the local district level, as well as at the school level, as you might guess, because we'll have fewer students, particularly fewer students perhaps in advanced coursework now required to take tests. We'll have fewer test takers and potentially fewer passing assessments. Um, we don't know exactly yet what that will look like, um, but that is something that we are working on. And as we get more information on how that will impact a specific schools, that is certainly something we will be working with those principals and regions around. As a next step, I would urge that we game that out before next year so that we can um, put in the supports necessary to address it before we get a bunch of um, 
threads on the matrices. Of course, and keep in mind, the impact for next year will be minimal in regard to this because students who are already in the high school pipeline will not see this reduction in verified credit. It's only the new students ninth entering grade. ninth grade next year who will have fewer and again, because of that expectation that they test at least once in grade nine to 12, we will still expect that, that incoming ninth grade class to be testing virtually in all of their academic areas that they're taking next year. Thank you, that's all of my questions. Okay, um, I have um, both Mr. Wilson and myself to ask a um, few questions, but um, Ms. Keys Kamara, we're pleased. Uh, you have arrived and uh, wanted to ask if you'd like to go before Mr. Wilson or would you, well, one more time. Are you sure? Okay, all right, well then I'll have Mr. Wilson go and then I'd like to have you go ahead before I close up. Thanks. Uh, thank you um, and thanks for the very uh, detailed presentation. And um, I'm, I'm happy to hear that some of the advocacy that Fairfax County has been seeking has been incorporated. Uh, so I hope that that means that in future years, we're gonna see some of the benefits of what we've been advocating for. Um, I, I do want to um, uh, say that I um, concur with Ms. Schultz's concerns about uh, the change, some of the changes, uh, and, and hope that um, those don't turn into things that we're having to talk about uh, with difficulty in future years. Um, my questions are fairly straightforward. They are more in the nature of clarifications. So if, if we could look at uh, slide eight, I believe. So, so this slide in, in, in the green level, it says made adequate improvement from yellow. And then in the yellow bar, it says improved from red. Is, is that, is there, is a distinction? Can you explain that distinction? What is adequate? And in the case of improving from red, is that any improvement, even if it's almost de minimis? So the specifics of what is necessary for that improvement side can be found in that linked matrix. And to give you a sense, in general terms, it means that a school's performance out the gate would have put them at, um, for instance, would have put them at the red level. However, when comparing their current year performance to their performance from the prior year, they have either reduced their failure rate by 10% or they have reduced their chronic absenteeism rate by 10% or they have improved their GCI by 2.5 points, or they have improved their um, drop or reduced their dropout rate, rate by 10%. So it's a slightly varied definition for each of those indicators to match and correspond to the expectations of that indicator. But it is basically giving the opportunity to recognize a school who is not yet quite into the next tier on this chart, but that has shown what is considered by the state to be substantial or adequate growth from their prior year's performance. And in that case, they are essentially rewarded by that, by being um, given that next year's performance, or that next level up. So, so you, I, I think if I distill what you said, then when you say made adequate improvement or just improved, it's the same, really. You're saying it's the, there is, they've reached an, whatever the state has determined is an adequate Correct. measure. Correct, yes, thank you. It's something like 10%. Okay, and because I, I, what I don't, what I, when I saw that I was a little worried that um, we might uh, mask uh, red schools by because they've made some progress, even if that some progress is very, uh, minute, but it sounds like what you're saying is that there's an actual substantial or adequate, I guess, is the state's uh, standard for that. So that that's um, very good to hear. And and um, with that, I will pass uh, okay. many time. Great. Uh, and Ms. Keys Gamara. Uh, I'm really sorry. I missed a, a good part of it. I'll go back to, and watch the tape. Um, but just a couple of questions. Uh, in reading it, um, I did have some concerns about the new standards with respect to absenteeism and 
who have we identified the schools that would be most impacted and what plans do we have to address those because it seems to me that that would need to be fairly extensive is that something that was discussed before oh can i get can i get the short version sure so we have um just in terms of what we said, that there was examples that were provided to us about what a school would have been 2016, 17 data. So we have that one picture that you actually can look on on the link on, I forgot what slide that is, um, 10. So you can actually see a sense of where your schools in your across the division might be. Simultaneously, the Office of Special Services, have uh, Marianne Panarelli and her team, have begun to look at some of the data of the schools and start to see some of the hot They've heat mapped some of the schools to identify 10% or more and looking at those. So they've identified some schools as well. We didn't provide that report today or the names of those schools, but we can discuss, follow up with you. And then also we're looking at how are we, one, communicating, messaging these changes, and also looking at what supports we can provide for those specific schools. Marianne Panarelli described some of the work we're doing through SKIPT and through our partnership with the county and some of those individuals who can help us, uh, again, think about school communities and parents where we're identifying some of those schools that are on that list. So we have two lists kind of, one we're kind of monitoring the current data to see uh, what we, where schools are uh, in terms of chronic absenteeism, and then we got a snapshot of an example from 1617 data. So I, I think I would be interested in that follow-up because I sure. uh, communication, as I've expressed before, is, is a big concern in terms of how we're communicating with our community. Yeah. and involving them and and i am deep you know wondering kind of how we can be more effective right particularly in those areas where i would anticipate to have problems mm -hmm. uh, if we don't have a solid plan that we're implementing beyond let's say hypothetically the newsletter or something like that right then i can imagine that it would not be very effective but i'm sure you guys are on that. Um, I did have other questions, but I'm, I'm just going to pass because you guys have probably talked a lot about some of the things that I am concerned about. And, I'll and feel free to reach offline or after the meeting. We can update you in some, and we can certainly give you more detail on the, well, we're going to be providing that to the full board on the chronic, chronic absenteeism aspect. Great. Thank you. Um, and Ms. Kiskamar, I know you had a work commitment, so we so appreciate that you, you, know, you were able to get here and, and being able to have the video will certainly uh, be helpful. I did want to make you aware and for the audience and certainly to reinforce for our clerk of the board that it was um, requested by Ms. Darinette Koufax and I'm going to very strongly um, second it that we do want the talking points um, from today's presentation. It Microphone. We want a full communications plan. Yes. That's what that, we asked Well, for. we're going to walk through all the next steps, but the, the initial part that I heard Ms. Darnett Koufax say, and as I was watching uh, Dr. Duran with this really awesome PowerPoint with notes attached to it, which I'm in bird's eye to see, was that's really helpful because these are uh, very technical slides and really without the narrative that you have with it, uh, especially for our colleagues who weren't here and for those of us who are very visual learners, I think that will be beneficial. Plus, it's something we can we can refer back to because we're going to want to try and explain some of this to our community as well. Um, so I do want to first say that uh, for a session that was supposed to be information only, um, and I thought for sure we would be able to do this in 90 minutes, but uh, with the dedicated interest of our board, um, we are now at 10 minutes behind. So I'm hoping we will... Uh, be able to wrap up our next steps in just a few minutes, break at 1.15 and be back at 1.45. So I'm going to be very quick right now because we could either spend hours on it or we're just going to need to follow up with Dr. Braybrand and Dr. Duran as needed. Um, but I do want to touch on some things my colleagues said. First of all, about the history SOL. As someone who st um, has a history degree at the undergraduate level, no one could be more of a proponent of social studies. However, I want to remind everybody, this is the state's testing. Some of us have said we don't even think it's the way we want to test a 21st century student. So keep in mind that while at a macro level, I don't think it speaks well for Virginia to say that we basically looked at our four core subjects and said history was the least significant, so we're going to drop it off. I thought we were going to just look at reducing the volume of 
testing among those four core subjects. So Dr. Bravery and I would just say, I hope you will take the pulse of this full board because when staff speaks for the school system, I hope they're also speaking for this board and maybe you're gonna just be hearing it from all of us today in general. I think we need to go back to the state and say, I'm not sure you understood exactly how we want to achieve this. It wasn't to just drop off an entire subject area. So, you know, technically we should have just been looking at reducing the number within math, language arts, and um, science and social science, not to just say we're just gonna rule out one altogether. Um, that said, um, I hope all of us understand that even though this test goes away, every single year, our students and our teachers sit in classrooms and they're actually learning for the sake of learning. And so their letter grade at the end of their school year, including the report card, should be the more qualitative and, and more valuable assessment of what they learned and what they knew. And so we should at least be measuring who's passing our classes and who's getting you know, lower than a C, and that's a reflection. Um, and then finally, I just think for a next step, I would like a little more clarity for our special education students about some of this, because I've been hearing from our special education community uh, about concerns on how the state does things with a standard diploma, with the SOL pass rates. And, and we just had a, a very strong advocate speak last Thursday night. You know, what are we messaging and signaling to our special education students sometimes when we make this about the diploma and um, the, the SOLs? So uh, with that, I would like to just go ahead and pull up our next steps and um, see if we can quickly go through to approve those. Okay, so again, um, we'll start with Mr. Moon. Can you please just read that in your head and then tell us if you think it captures what you were wanting to say? And other board members where you can see yours up there, pre-read it right now. I think if I heard what you were asking, it was around the 990. The, the waiver of the seat time, how many students take advantage of that? Is that correct? Not the internships and that other piece, so. I'm not sure we have detailed data on how many students have the waiver. We do have information, for example, on how many students take the economic personal finance class that's offered online that has the, wait, the seat time waivered. But in terms of those exception kinds of things, I don't think we have any way to capture that and, and report on that data. Could you just double check whether we don't have any data at all? And if we certainly have data on those how many students well, take online courses and those kinds of things. But in terms of well, individual, but don't we have? They have to fill out a form to get the waiver. There's a form that parents fill out. So either, wonder, either I don't no, think we no. capture that in SIS. I'm very concerned that we would have to go back to individual schools okay, and have it. Okay, a, okay, okay. Listen, this is what we talked about before. I want to set the tone. The tone is you have a next step. We need to look our first thing is maybe not sure let's and it's important i do want to bring up as you are mary beth that it may not be a quick five second thing we may have to look elsewhere it could be a manual pull or we'll come back and go oh my gosh to do it would require this additional time and resources but yeah dr Breber, so, i actually in, in the interest of time for all of us i i like exactly what you said and i'll make it even simpler here's your here's a request for a next step we will rely on Dr. Braybrand to talk with our chair and vice chair. If any next step of any kind ends up not being realistic, can't be produced, I, I'm with Mary Beth Loveglass and everybody here. I mean, there's if it's a data poll that is not essential and it's just going to be a time suck, to put it right. you know bluntly, then let's not do it. Okay. As right. long as we clarified it around from the previous. But yeah, we certainly can bring back what we have, what we don't have, and why we don't have it. Yeah. I think that's what you're saying. And, yeah, and, you know. and to be clear, if it's not essential information, it's it's it would be nice to have if we could. And I know Mr. Moon's always a huge advocate for that, if it, if it can be. I mean, for, for me, it's an essential information. It doesn't have to be brought to me tomorrow. I can wait okay. until next time we have this discussion. We will bring right. back oh, based without, on what without, we have without, without the data. 
I mean, I cannot even start having the discussion. Thank you, Mr. Moon, for that clarification. Seat time, not seat. Uh, Ms. Evans, you had signaled you needed okay. to speak. Part, and one of the reasons that students can get a waiver is they can get a waiver from a full day for health reasons, such as opting out of first period. Not very many people know that, but we do still offer that. And as we go down the road of thinking about uh, whether it's absenteeism or redesign of high schools, it would be important to know how many middle schoolers and high schoolers take advantage of the, the waiver uh, from a full day schedule for health reasons as well. That, that's a different issue, though, as relates to the question Mr. Moon asked. It's a, it's a different type of waiver, if you will, but we, it's not connected to the seat time at the high school level. I, I, well, we, there's a form. Uh, there's there is a, a form. There's a form that they have to fill out if they're going to take a, an online course rather than a full course, um, right? There's a, I'm pretty sure there, there is. No? Is if it you're just wanting to know. I don't think you, the, you well, just the want form is related to this. I think it may not be, a re, you're saying it's not, a, it's not related to accreditation, but it could be about the ultimate redesign of high school. You'd like to know the less than seven period day waiver, what the numbers are for that. And again, I think. That's different we, than seat time. What we can do is we right. can take back this as a piece of the conversation. We'll be back in about a month when we come to talk about high school pathways and expansions, which was already going to be part of our presentation. Right. And then we can share at that time what we have, what we don't have, and the different variables that right. you're asking so, about. So which the is other different question, Mr. Moon is asking waiver for about. seat time and waiver for seventh period day. OK. I'm a little worried that Mr. Moon's question is yeah. pretty overly simplified and, and therefore could be extremely broad. Like, I don't know how staff's going to know. I know we know what the essence of his question is. And we're clear on that. It's just how sure. do we, what do we have available and how we can present that to you when we come back in the work session. But we're, we're, we're rather than more time on here, we definitely know what you mean, Mr. Yes, Doctor, Doctor, and, and I'm also looking at people in the back corner nodding. Oh, so we, well, we got it. Well, this is the Madam Clark that waiver for seven period there, that's not my request, so you don't have to put my name behind that. Maybe that's Miss Evans. And and that is I do want to add that request, so I'd ask the board to, to get that as well. Okay. Um uh, so I, I'm while she's typing that in, can I just have a quick show of hands on those first two next steps? Are people fine with making that request to staff to ask for that information to the best of staff's ability to capture it? Great. Okay. Um, Ms. Schultz, um, can you please, re please read yours? It, it's what you would like. Okay. So can everyone read that and hands up? We're all good with asking that information. Okay. Um, the next bullet doesn't have an author. Provide additional data on absenteeism by school when it becomes available. And can I ask for specifics on that? Are we looking asking for chronic absenteeism? So I think yeah. that probably is mine. Right. And and yes, I think that you should be that if if the measure that we're providing to the state now is, and what the accountability is going to be on the chronic absenteeism, as Dr. Braybrand brought up, that now it's not not just unexcused absences; it includes excused absences. Who among our schools would fall into this category, right. and by what quanti? I mean. So we'll it's add to chronic. Quantify, it's to quantify where we stand now so that we understand the right. magnitude or lack thereof, which I imagine, yeah. We're working on that for this summer. This is a, this is a large effort in terms of doing uh, reporting on absenteeism and how it relates to the standards of accreditation. We're working on that and we can for this summer. You don't have a dipstick now of how many students have missed that are on, on target to miss? Um, we certainly have school, you know, individual schools are working with individual students and we actually have an automated phone system to call out that does it when kids have missed a certain number of days. But in terms of a division-wide report, school by school, associated with the specific rules of the standards of accreditation, we're working on that collaboratively with our friends in special right. services for this summer. Right, we're working on the new, but we'll, all we do have right now is the individual based on 2016-17, the, the individual school reports. Whatever. We have that, which we have a link to in, this, in the PowerPoint, and that shows every school in every region who would be a red, who would be a yellow, who would be a green, 
based on these new measures. Again, that's based on 1617 data. But it doesn't have the actual number of students. Um, no, I, it does not. But I, Marianne, you're saying? We can get that to yeah, you. Okay. I, I didn't think All this right. was that hard. We've got the data. So, Ms. Schultz, do you want your question clarified that says additional data related to number provide, of students? Provide existing data on the number of students who would qu qualify for being determined to be chronically absent. System-wide. System-wide. By school, though. You want to advise system-wide by school. So what she's trying to say is she's trying to understand which schools have the chronic absenteeism and what's the actual number of students. Okay, we have that again. Right, where it qualifies as 10% or more. We have that for the example reports, which are 16, 17 data. That gives you a snapshot. We can give you that. Yes, if that's you're asking perfect. for the most current no, no, one no, right this year, we don't have that. what we have right now, which is 2016 But for the 17. example reports, we can get you that. I understand we have that level of detail. Okay, great. Hands up for that one, please. But would this be system-wide? Wouldn't it be just students by school? It's by school, and oh. it also is system-wide. I oh. have it both ways. Both ways. Okay, so system-wide and by school. Okay. Yeah, okay. All right, um, Ms. Darren at Koufax, providing... Or provide talking points from this presentation on new state standards accreditation to the board. That's easy. We have. Them. That's yeah. easy. That's good. We have them. We can just Hands provide up. them to you. All right. There we go. Um, what can I just ask though something? So then I talked about having some kind of communications plan that's about. The next slide. Well, but it's not listed in there. It's my can't. Well, because what was what's what I started out saying was let's do that on absenteeism, and then that's not listed in that one. No. Mm -hmm. So, so okay. could we say develop a communications plan for new standards accreditation and absentee, chronic absenteeism? The chronic that, absenteeism is part of the new standards yeah, of accreditation. Yeah, it's for each of the new standards of accreditation, okay. including chronic absenteeism. Okay. All right. And then, Ms. Um, Koufax, then, do you want your name added there as a joint request? You don't care. Okay. All right. The next piece of that is that it has it's beyond yes. just including the role of the school and system wide. It's also reaching out beyond the school and the system to include our partners at the board of supervisors, our partners in the faith based community, our partners. Let's say no, 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 no. we're going to go there back. Just community stakeholders. Community and community stakeholders. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. But we, it's got to be a detailed. We understand. We got it. We understand. OK, great. Um, we'll just keep going. Uh, well, I thought we were going to do them both together. So they were. So that's fine. Ro vote on Ms. Corbett Sanders <laughs> on our communications plan. Mr. Moon, you support it. The communications plan, great. All right, uh, next one out is pull out all of our non-regional schools into a non-regional section rather than including them in the pyramid data by Ms. Corbett Sanders, hands up. And again, to clarify, the schools are part of the region, but you're asking me to put them in a separate spot. They're re they are assigned to a region, but you want them in a separate section. Well, you have the um, resource today has by region and it includes it as though so for example Bryant is within the West Potomac pyramid uh, and so on the summary so, data you want it separated right so Got what it, it should be because be, you yes. have a non-regional category and it only includes one school but the reality is all of our alternative schools are non-regional because they pull students from multiple regions but to go to the can school. I, can I do a clarification? I can do an example. So I was ask, asking about how many of my students from my district um, are graduating from the various alternative schools um, because I'm trying to figure out, I'm trying to quantify. So for example, Mountain View, I have 29 students graduating. From Quanda Road, I have three. You know, from Pulley Center, I have 14. From Key Center, I have six. So what, what Ms. Corbett Sanders is trying to get to is just because a school is in a region, it doesn't mean the students are from that region. And so we're not accurately reflecting if we just 
denote that it's with the region, in, at any time, a, a majority of them could be completely from a different region. So it's not, it doesn't, it's not reflective. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? I, I, I do. Let us, let us dip, let us take a deeper dive and figure out. I, I get the idea here. One is just the organizational structure. The other is the political implications of a tying accreditation to these schools that are really system schools, not regional. So let us, let us, I, I, let us noodle that and come back with something. I, I'm not ready to, I don't want to pull all the non-regional schools out of the region structure, but you are talking about in the reporting style how that they cannot be labeled to rep regional schools. Right. Well, I, I mean, I do think, Ms. Corbett Sanders, if, if I heard you correctly, Bryant being lumped in with West Potomac is not accurate at all because Bryant has nothing to do with West Potomac. Is that right, Ms. Corbett Sanders? So does everybody understand why that's problematic? Yes. How, how, that's how about to this? To clarify, they're not in their pyramid data. Right. That's it. How about how about it, this? It's could, just how it's organized. How about how the, about how about could we, Karen? Could we put something where we go? We will review how we present accreditation data for our non-regional schools. Or non -traditional. Non -traditional, non traditional schools. Non traditional. And figure out we how could to call it non traditional. That. I mean, we can. Yes, that this sounds is. great. Hands up, everybody. Great. Okay. Uh, the next bullet consider future advocacy on impact alternative schools have on four year graduation piece. I don't understand what consider future advocacy, how that's an action item. I, I'm, I don't know if you can provide clarity there. I think you can just put monitor the need for future advocacy. So you're, so Ms. Corbett Sanders, I think what you're trying to say is we need to be mindful that with state accreditation changes, how does this impact students who attend our alternative high schools? Correct. Okay. Dr. Brabrand, do you understand that would just be a, a board Yeah, I understand. The, 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 the current desire. system lets the plans transition out. How will they perform under this new tighter GCI, we need to be looking at that and seeing if there's going to be a negative impact. And if it were, would we restructure the way we do it based on the new state standards? So I, I, yeah, I don't think we're there yet. We haven't, this is the thing, I love this about Fairfax. I'm just saying this. We're presenting this early, it's next year. Some of it is, and it is, you guys going, let's go three or four moves ahead. We're not there yet. We haven't gained that out on our alternative, but I think we do need to monitor it. If it's gonna have a negative impact, it would, we would do something around how we structure those schools. I'm just asking in the terms of a next step, how this is a next step, like, it's 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 a next 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 step. Like, I don't know. Uh, I I it. see it as a next step in that we're asking Dr. Braber and his staff to be monitoring this situation going forward. It's it's a next step. We're saying it be has intentional. a likely, it has a likely impact on us if we don't watch it over time yep. and if it. Yeah. Paying attention. We're good with it. keeping it in because, frankly, we'll start watching it. And if we want to bring you a different model or talk about a different way to do it, we'll have from this conversation that you brought up, hey, it's something to be looking at over the next three to five years. I, I will just say uh, to our clerk, at, not now to Wordsmith, but there's some missing individual words in there that make it unclear. So, you know, saying something like monitor need for future advocacy on the impact of these changes on our alternative schools. I mean, it's just, if you read that sentence, it doesn't, but we don't need to wordsmith it. Just want to make sure you're looking at that to make it clear for later. Um, provide clarity on graduation requirements on slide 24 for math counting towards sequential electives for advanced studies diploma. Everybody clear on that? Supportive of it? Great. Last one. Clear, clarity on the impact of this for our special education students. Dr. Brabrand, Dr. Duran, does that make sense what you're talking about? The impact of these cha of these changes, these state accreditation the academic, changes. I mean, okay. well. Does that make sense, everybody? Francisco, go ahead now. Speak. Look, yeah. this is this is good. I want I want to create it where we we, we have a tendency. I, we I was more intentional. I had said that you know I wanted to just get an idea of what's happening with um, you know our the standard academic? diploma, 
the standard well, the, diploma. The standard, look at the standard diploma, and then the also our SOL piece. pass. But the also the SOL, you know. I mean, because yeah, I think we need a little more clarity, but mm -hmm. I'm not sure exactly what. In general, I mean, a lot of it is the same when it comes to chronic absenteeism, those types of things. It's the same for specialized students. But if you're asking specifically around the so diploma, Dr. Duran, so, asking, so Dr. Duran, we I just had, want to understand, yeah, and I'm not maybe right. I'm not clear. No, that's okay. We we <laughs> had we had a, a a parent speaker on Thursday talking about that. You know, right now, that the way that the state defines students for passing on on SOLs. Right. That can be very challenging for some of our special sure. education students, especially those who are on the autism spectrum. Sure. So as we talked about a next step from Ms. Corbett Sanders on, are we monitoring this and, and pretend, potentially needing to advocate for more realistic expectations and requirements on our students? So so I was just can trying we, to get some clarity on my last, last, so last maybe, bullet. That maybe can we word it, and if I didn't hear you correctly, around review the impact of these on students yeah. for special education and bring back anything that we feel should be advocated for further perfect yep rather than clarity on the whole thing yeah, rather just the if there are some areas that we any believe any recommended future okay. advocacy okay perfect does that sound okay that you captured that beautifully all right yep are we ready to go okay all hands on the last one great thank you all right so at this point, what are we at? Um, 132. So let me ask board members, do you want your full 30 minutes or can I shave off any time of your lunch? All right, uh, so so no, I, no one's, I'm not seeing anybody saying shave off time except Ms. Schultz, so we will. Our kids can eat in less time than we're proposing to eat. Uh, well, at this point, I wanna be able to be clear for staff. Staff, we will start at two o'clock. Great job.